This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Tick Ticks. Buying tickets shouldn't be anonymous. We are built for fans, by fans. Available on Android and iOS. Are you ready? Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. The NHL expansion draft and the NHL entry draft are in the books, and it's been a wild ride for the Flames this week. As always, I'm Dan Stevenson, alongside my co-host Matt DeBorg. Matt, it's end of June, and here we are talking hockey. How's your summer going so far? Good. Uh, It's been a rather uneventful time as a Flames fan. Nothing much important has happened. (laughs) Well, then I guess we should just stop the show right here. Yeah, it, it was a fairly boring week. The Flames Only... unveiled a boring jersey, draft some boring players, and now Tree's going on vacation. Yep. Nothing to see here. All right, well, let's let's talk about some of the boring trades that happened then. Um, going into this offseason, I think you and I had identified the same needs as Flames management. The Flames needed a goalie. They needed a top four defenseman. They needed a right winger. And two of those they've addressed so far. From the GM who's known not to trade draft picks, they've given up a crap load of draft picks and two major deals done. Uh, We'll start chronologically. The first one is the Flames acquired Mike Smith, the goaltender from uh, the Arizona Coyotes, in exchange for... The rights to Brandon Hickey, the rights to goaltender Chad Johnson, and a 2018 conditional third-round pick. Uh, Actually, it's a 2019. They just clarified that yesterday. Oh, oh, is it? Okay, so 2019 uh, third-round pick. And that third-round pick will become a second-round pick if the Flames qualify for the playoffs in 2017-2018. So, I mean, going into this offseason, the Flames had no goaltenders signed. Elliott's a free agent. Johnson's a free agent. Interesting deal here. There was a number of goalies on the market. You knew that I was hoping that we'd either get Smith, Ranta, or Darlene. Darlene was off the table. Ranta is now off the table. And, Mike, what do you think of the acquisition of Mike Smith? Well, you got to figure that that Treliving knew Mike Smith and what he was capable of because of the fact that that was the organization he worked for prior to coming to Calgary, as well as Don Maloney, who's one of our scouts. He was the general manager in Arizona. So when you know that this guy is a good goaltender and can do the job, especially after Elliott had a terrible playoffs, you want to make sure that you know who you're getting. And there's no question on Mike Smith. He's a fairly good goaltender. He plays a very similar style of game as Marty Turco. So that'll help with the Flames transition game because he's basically a third defenseman. It will be an adventure for sure at times. And, you know, you can't expect the occasional bad goal, but it he is a good goalie. And unfortunately for him, he's been stuck behind a really terrible Arizona Coyotes team who was artificially good just due to the good coaching from uh dave tippett and they couldn't rebuild properly because of the fact that they'd overperform their actual talent level so for those that don't know about mike smith he's a uh he's a left-handed goaltender 35 years old from kingston ontario six foot four 215 pounds He's played in the NHL since the 06-07 season with Dallas. He's played for Dallas, Tampa Bay, and he's been with the Coyotes since uh, 2011-2012. In this deal, Smith's contract, 25% of it has been absorbed by Arizona, which means the Flames are on the hook for $4.25 million. Matt, is this? do you think another situation where the Flames are bringing in a veteran goaltender just as a stopgap, what do you think? I mean, Smith is on a two-year deal. He's 35 now. There's no chance they re-sign him after this. Do you think that Smith is going to do... I mean, we all liked the acquisition of Brian Elliott last year. Do you think Smith is going to do better than Elliott? And why do you think so, if you do? I do, uh, mainly because Smith has been a starting goaltender for a number of years where Elliott did have those question marks because he has only been a 40-game guy. And... You know, with Smith, he's played on some 
horrible teams in Arizona. And so his, statistically, he's not the best goalie. And But you put him in front of a team that has four really dynamite defensemen and a good group of forwards, your stats are going to improve. So I'm sure that the team will perform better with him in that than Elliot. He's not in wildly inconsistent like Elliot was, or Johnson for that matter. So it it'll be a consistent goaltending performance, and it gives the Flames just enough time to allow both Gillies and Riddich to sort themselves out for the next year, and then moving forward with Tyler Parsons after that. For those that are wondering, Chad Johnson was only part of this deal. His contract expires July 1st, but he was only part of the deal simply because Arizona needed a goaltender to protect in the expansion draft. So Johnson fulfilled that. I think you're right about Smith here. I think, you know what, he's an older guy, but older often means more seasoned. We're not looking at this guy to be a, you know, six, seven year goaltender for us. He's a stopgap. He's a transition to buy us time to either find a young guy currently in our system or somebody else. And I think, you know, if we start looking at the Flames as a contending team, which I think we have to, especially after the moves that have been made, contending teams will often take on veterans, right? They'll plug those holes with veterans. And I think that's exactly what the Flames are doing here. Yeah, like it, it's not like they have Matt Murray in their system that who is ready to step in right now today. Because if that was the case, like if Gillies or Parsons was ready right now to be the starter, then they'd probably just go with that. But they're showing a lot of potential and maybe in a year or two they might be in that conversation but that's not today i and i like the mike smith contract too 4.25 million for your starter gives us some money to bring in a backup or do whatever we want to do there yeah i think you'd probably agree smith probably isn't the goaltender that gets to the stanley cup but smith is probably a goaltender that gets us past round one well, actually, Smith pretty much carried Arizona a number of years ago all the way to the conference finals, a te Arizona team that really had no business going anywhere. You see guys do it once, though. You hardly ever see them do it twice. Yeah, but that was the only time that Arizona had a somewhat decent team. You put the Flames forward group and defense group in front of them, and you're not needing to rely on Smith to be like prime Mika Kiprasov. You just need him to be decent and the flames should have a, the ability to go far just because of that. As long as he doesn't give up seven bad goals in four games, basically <laughs> like Elliot did. Yeah, no, for sure. I'm worried about this revolving door of goaltending here in Calgary, but I, I'm optimistic that Smith will, give us enough of a sort of a stability that we can figure out what's next and who's next after this. Yeah. And that's what we need. Like you look at Gillies, he's pretty much ready for the NHL, him or Riddich. And you've got Parsons who is probably the best goalie prospect in the NHL right now. So, and he's going to be in the ECHL this year. And he may only be a year or two away. So it's one of those things that it it's not right yet, but it's very close. So you just need somebody to hold the fort. And for those worried about the return of Brandon Hickey in this, uh, Brandon Hickey was a promising prospect. You and I have followed him for a while. We've talked to him on a number of our rookie camp shows. It sounds like Hickey just didn't want to sign with the Flames. So, yeah, I think that like the Treliving was uh, saying that like he expected Hickey to sign, and then Hickey went back for his final year, which you know that's basically I'm not signing with you. So you know at that point, I have an asset that I'm going to get nothing for. Something is better than nothing, and the something being Mike Smith is better than having him just walk. So looking at the return, if we take Chad Johnson off the table, since he's a UFA anyways, and we look at Brandon Hickey and let's call it a second round pick. There's no way we don't make the playoffs. Yeah, um, we'd have to have like seven people get hurt <laughs> in order for that to happen. So Hickey in a second for Mike Smith. I'm happy with that return, considering Hickey again was an asset we're not going to use. So Mike Smith for a second, essentially the same thing we paid for Elliott. I think that's a decent return. 
Yeah, I agree. And it's a 2019 pick, so it's not like it's right now either. So, you know, it it sucks to lose prospect and pick capital, but as Trilliving said after the Hamannick trade, you need to give to get, and it sucks, but unfortunately that's what needs to be done, and the Flames got what they needed, and now it's just a matter of seeing how things shake out. Let's talk about that Hamannick trade. So we know that the Flames have three top defensemen in Giordano, Brody, and Hamilton. They brought Stone in last year to fill that top four role, but we knew that we needed a you know a full time number four, and the Flames went out and got that number four on day two of the draft, in a bit of a convoluted deal here. So we'll go, I'll go through it, and then we'll explain some of the conditions. The Flames acquired Travis Hamonic and the Islanders' fourth round pick in 2019 or 2020 in exchange for our first round pick in 2018 and our second round pick in 2018 and a second round pick in 2019 or 2020. So essentially, because the 2019 second round pick may go to Arizona in the Smith deal, if we make the playoffs next year, which we assume we will, we don't have a 2019 pick, so then our 2020 second round pick goes to the Islanders, and whatever it, whatever year the second round pick is, is the year we get a fourth round pick back. Yeah. So basically, it, after all said and done, it's... A first and a second this year and dropping like 35 to 40 spots in the draft with the second pick. So not that big of a deal. It's more or less like the Hamilton trade, but not even as much asset wise. So for those that don't know Travis Hamannick, he's a natural right shooting defenseman, something that we've needed. He was uh, born in 1990, which makes him 26 years old. He's six foot two, 205 pounds. Played his whole career with the Islanders organization, but he's a Manitoba boy. So from around here, he said that he grew up watching a lot of Flames hockey. And I think to me, the best thing about this deal is again, just like Smith, the cap hit. Uh, we get. Hamannick in on a three more years at 3.8 million per year. So if we look at our defensive contracts for the next year, we've got Giordano at 6.7 million, Dougie Hamilton at 5.7 million, TJ Brody at 4.6 and Travis Hamannick at 3.8. So pretty reasonable contract considering what we're getting there. But Matt, the biggest question that's been asked by Flames fans is did the Flames overpay for Hamannick? What are your thoughts? Absolutely not. They, You have to figure that, yeah, Hamannick is going to come in and be the Flames' number four defenseman. And intrinsically, a first and two second round picks for a number four defenseman is a ludicrous price. However, on about 20 to 25 teams in the NHL, Hamannick is a number two defenseman or a number one defenseman. It's just that Calgary already has three amazing defensemen already, and now we've got a fourth one. And now it's basically Calgary, Anaheim, and Nashville with the three best defense groupings in the NHL. And if the Flames do end up re-signing Mike Stone, which Treliving said they are trying to, that will make it for sure the Flames do have the best and deepest defense core in the entire league. When I saw this too, the first thing I thought of is, you know what, Gio is injury prone. Let's be honest. You know, we got a full year out of him last year, but he's getting older. Those injuries are going to happen more. I feel comfortable with Hamannick stepping into a number two role if that were to happen. Yeah, same here. And that's why, like, getting another veteran defenseman to be the number five would be ideal so that way if an injury or two happens which give me a break it you know it sucks but it does happen you're not stuck playing Bartkowski as the number five and then some rookie as the number six like it, you're gonna be able to maneuver <laughs> a little easier that way so if I look at our top four defense now Giordano Hamilton Brody Hamannick I got to think that we have one of the top defensive cores in the league, if not the top defensive core in the league. What do you think? Yeah. Well, I just said that, and it, only Anaheim and Nashville can even make it a debate. Like, There's nobody else that has four defensemen that are of that caliber, and if the Flames get a fifth one via Stone, 
then they're like Nashville's third pairing defense are not as good and same with Anaheim. So it'll be interesting. So Matt, I mean, we all as fans put value, I think sometimes too high a value on a first round pick. Darren Loudfoot, one of our listeners who gives us a lot of feedback, commented on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash fireside chat, saying that he worries that the flames may be overvaluing their own prospects. He, he, was wondering if maybe we should have tried to trade some of our own defensive prospects like Shillington or Anderson, or even some of our forward prospects to make this deal instead of the draft picks. And he's wondering if um, the flames are overvaluing those guys thinking that they're worth more if no one wants to take them from what I was hearing leading up to the draft they they didn't want prospects. They wanted to take on draft picks. They want to, you know, use those picks to get whoever they want. I personally don't think the Flames are overvaluing guys like Shillington, like Anderson, like Kulak. I think we know what we've got there. But just because somebody doesn't want to take them in this deal doesn't necessarily mean that they're not good players. They're not ready. They're not, you know, top six or even top four defensemen yet. Um, so, you know, to me, I think, as you mentioned earlier, Trill Living said it, you've got to give something to get something. When you become a team that's a contender, you give up draft picks. Look at any team that's a contender. Look at what they do either at the draft or at the uh, the trade deadline. They give up draft picks. It's what they do. You mortgage your future for now. And both these deals look like the Flames are doing that to me. But, Matt, what do you think? Are you worried that the Flames might be overvaluing their prospects? Uh, well, to an extent, maybe. Uh, like, I, I know that Jankowski is going to be a good quality NHL player and likely Anderson as well. With all the other guys, it's a wait and see. It's just like the goalies. Gillies, Parsons, and Riddich, they all had good seasons last year, some more so than others. But just because they had a good year last year does not necessarily mean they're going to have a good year this year. And you basically just need to let guys sort it out themselves. You've got players with a proven track record of talent it's just, are they going to show that they're taking those next steps, sort of like what Jankowski did last year by being one of the top AHL players? Like, he's showing that he's basically ready for the NHL right now, and you can sort of pencil him into the lineup moving forward. So, it's just that most of our guys that are high quality are also very young and just in their first or second year in the AHL, or not even yet. So you're it, there's still more of an unknown quantity. Are they going to develop into anything or not? And I think you have to remember too that when you take on a player like let's say a Shillington or an Anderson or somebody like that, you're taking on a contract, and teams can only have fifty contracts. So that's something to to remember as well. That you know what you can only have so many contracts there. That might be a reason not to take somebody's players and just get a draft pick but also if you get the draft pick you're responsible for getting who you want you know you're not saying well this is the best guy calgary has maybe snow says you know what i want to put that destiny destiny in my own hands yeah exactly and plus the islanders know that like what their own needs are at the time where calgary doesn't really you know we might have exactly what they're strong in so I think it it's also good easy, it's also easier to flip that pick than it would be to flip a prospect. Let's say they were to bring in, let's just say for the sake of argument, Shillington went their way. And then at the deadline, they want to flip Shillington for something else. I think it's harder to reflip a prospect. It's a lot easier to say, take Calgary's first round pick and send it somewhere else. Yeah, because then why are you trading this guy that you just acquired? You know, like, exactly. So, so I think in, if you look at it in terms of currency, draft picks are better currency. Yeah, exactly. So I don't think this necessarily has anything to do with the value of Flames prospects. I think that, you know what, Snow is just wanting currency. And if he wants a prospect from somebody, he can easily trade one of those picks for someone's prospect, be it ours, be it somebody else's. But it's just, it makes better sense in terms of better currency. Any other thoughts on these two trades, Matt? Well, now the Flames are unquestionably going for it. And now it's just a matter to see if they acquire a number one or number five defenseman and like what they're going to do up front to round out the team. But 
it seems like they're ready to go and honestly with the lineups that i've been looking at for like potential fits for calgary i honestly don't see very many if any weaknesses in the organization top to bottom so you have to figure that in the organization or on the flames roster yeah that's what i meant and because of that i'm thinking that the flames may end up being becoming one of the top three or four teams in the conference and maybe even a cup contender this year we'll talk about some of those fits and what we need a bit later um but i agree with what you said there's un there's no question how the flames are going for it if you're a rebuilding team and you make these deals you probably get fired as a gm when yeah. you're rebuilding first and second round picks are your best currency again like the islanders they need a bit of a rebuild this is a currency for them yeah and especially with the flames if they're going for it you know, if you're trading an unprotected first round pick like they did for next season, you don't want that to be a lottery pick and then, oh, gee, we just won the lottery. Great. We just gave up Dolan for nothing. So, you know, it, we're wanting that pick to be in the 25 to 31 range, not, you know. Yeah. But I mean, if you look at, you know, if the Flames are in win now mode, and when I say now, I mean, you know, three to four years or, you know, up to four years, I say one to four years. I think that we've got the pieces we need and those pieces in the long run are going to do us more good in a win now scenario than a first and a second are. Yeah. Well, honestly, I think the win now is literally starting today and we're going for it. And yeah, hopefully we actually do win the cup in the next couple seasons. So, Talking about the future of this team, the entry draft is over. Um, why don't we take a look at some of the players the Flames picked there? You remember the Flames had a bit of a gap here. They picked in the first round, had no second round pick and, or third round pick due to the uh, Smith and La- or yeah, sorry, the Stone and Lazar trades, and then they picked again rounds four, five, six, and seven. So, Matt, you and I talked about the first round last show that we were, we did. Um, I think we were both a little bit surprised with this one. I don't know about you, but I was. With the 16th overall selection, the Flames picked a defenseman. Smart strategy. That's what I thought we should do last time. And they picked Yusuf Valamaki. Uh, he's a 18-year-old defenseman, six two, 212 pounds. He's Finnish, a left-shooting defenseman who played with the Tri-City Americans and on the Finnish U-20 team last year. Uh, your thoughts on Valamaki's acquisition? Well, now it becomes an interesting conversation. Who got the better finished defenseman, the Vancouver Canucks with Ole Juolevi or the Flames with Yusuf Valamaki? And that'll be a nice little debate that the two fan bases can have for the next little while. Uh, Valamaki is a very tall defenseman. Well, not overly tall at 6'2", but... For Flames prospects, it's tall. And he's a good offensive defenseman. Had 61 points last year. Just a good two-way defenseman. He's a little weak on the defensive side of the puck. But, uh, you know, you look at Giordano and Brody at the same age. They were a little weak on the defensive side of the puck, too. It was their offensive instincts that were notable. And... You know, it does take some time, and I have no doubt that Valimaki will play in the NHL. He's, when he's 6'2 and 2'10 and he looks thin on the ice, (laughs) that, you know, he should fill out a little more. He looks very lanky on the ice, so I'm expecting him to eventually be a 4'5 guy at, like, more of, like, his floor with the potential of him being a top two defenseman. I think that Valimaki, for me, when I look at his game and sort of where he's at, I think he could develop into what we hoped Weidman would be and never made it to. I think he's going to be more of a defensive defenseman, more of a Hamannick type. Um, But I think he can, yeah, he can make it in. He can be a number four guy. I mean, Weidman had a great shot. I don't know if Valimaki is going to have that, but definitely a guy who will make you know, a, an impact on your NHL team. I think anyone who thinks Valimaki will get the Kachuk treatment and make the NHL, you know, the year after he's drafted is probably going to be disappointed. I think that Valimaki is 
two, maybe three years out from being in the NHL, which is fine. We don't need him. We've got lots of defensive prospects. We can give him the time he needs to develop. Yeah, and he may be actually eligible for the AHL sooner than normal because he was a uh, uh, European like import, but uh, he was on loan from his team, so he may even be eligible, even though he played in juniors, he may be eligible for the AHL next year. If not, it'll be the year after because of his birthday because he was one of the oldest players in the draft this year. So I'm happy with the Valimaki pickup. I was hoping for Cal Foot. Cal Foot went in at 14. So you know what? I think there was a whole group of defensemen there that we started going one at a time. And it's not the guy I expected the Flames to take, but I'm happy with the pick. Yeah, exactly. I wasn't expecting Valimaki. I was expecting either Foot or Lilligren if they were going D-man. But I, I have zero complaints at all. So, you know, they got full value for the pick. And, you know, you look at the success of Nashville and Anaheim with the fact that they've got defensemen coming out (laughs) of the woodwork here, there, and everywhere. Having, like, as we've mentioned before, Giordano's not a young defenseman. Eventually, we're going to have to replace him. So having Valimaki, Anderson, Shillington... Fox and Falkovsky, you hope that one of those five guys who's all of them have high potential, that one of them will emerge to be someone who can replace Giordano two, three, four years down the road. Or who's good enough that they can be used as currency to replace Giordano. Exactly. So that way, as the Flames transition to having Hamilton, Hamannick, and Brody being the face of the defense core you have these other guys pushing up on the bottom end so that way you're having like a solid one through six regardless of what at what point in the process you're at the next pick the flames made was the fourth round 109th overall and they used that pick to select from the sarnia sting adam ruziska and he's a Slovakian centerman. He can also play winger. Six foot four, two hundred and nine pounds. Last year playing for Sarnia, he had twenty five goals, twenty one assists for forty six total points. Um, you can never go wrong with a big centerman in the organization. Matt, what are your thoughts on this pick? I honestly do not understand the other thirty teams in the league. Everybody needs big centers that have talent. Why was he available in round four? Like, I mean, I re- if you look, he was ranked number 45 by ISS. He was number 40 by McKean's Hockey, 59th by Future Considerations. This guy dropped quite a bit. Yeah, it, like, yeah, he had a bad season, but m- most guys that come over from Europe to Canada, most of them do have a inconsistent season because they're learning English and you know like it's a completely different culture so it's a lot to adapt to so you know yeah he didn't have a great season this year but like there is absolutely no reason this guy should have made it out of round two let alone falling to round four with his size alone like he's a decent skater not great like he will need to work on that but it's not like a huge hindrance he's not david wolf out there but like i just don't understand the other 30 teams like everybody needs size and like okay well thanks for letting him drop to us we'll take him but like why didn't somebody else you know (laughs) i think this is going to be a really good dark horse pick for the flames if at fourth round he turns into nothing, that's fine. It was a fourth-round pick. But I think this guy has a chance to become a bottom six forward. He's, he even he, has the top six upside. Like, his hands are really good. So, like, that's what really doesn't make a lot of sense. Like, he does have that upper-end potential. Not that he's going to necessarily reach that potential, but the skill is there where if things do go right, he could develop into that. So, like, that's why it really doesn't make a lot of sense why he was even available to fall to us. 
We'll see what happens with with this player. And for fans that want to watch him, he does play in Sarnia of the OHL. So here in Canada, fairly easy to get a hold of OHL footage if you want to see him next year. He wears number 21 for Sarnia. Yeah, and you know, for those l- that were lamenting the fact that we didn't have a second or third round pick, well, this is as good as a second round pick. Yeah, exactly. Like, uh, if the, you know, if the Flames had our second and that's who we took, it'd be like, hey, great, we got a guy with size, yeah, and some skill. So very like, similar uh, sure. to the year that we, you know, got traded for Hamilton and still got two great defensemen in round two. Yeah, exactly. It's like, okay, thanks, that fell in our lap. Awesome. <laughs> The next pick the Flames made was in the fifth round, uh, pick number 140 overall, and they picked a right winger this time from Lloyd Minster, Alberta, born in 1997, which makes him 19 years old. He's six foot two, 205 pounds, Zach Fisher. And Zach Fisher has played for the Medicine Hat Tigers of the WHL for the last three years. AHL fans of the Hitmen will probably have seen him quite a bit. Last year, he had a pretty good year with the Tigers. He got uh, 63 points in the regular season and 10 points in in the postseason for the Tigers. Um, right shot, again, I'm quite a fan of this pick. I think at fifth round, Fisher is a, another bit of a wild card, but a guy that has some, I think, some significant upside. Yeah, and he uh, had a pretty mediocre draft year last year, but then exploded and scored 50 more points than he had in his draft year. Yeah, last year he got 8 points, 5 assists for 13 points. Yeah, so it's one of those things that sometimes guys do figure it out. Like Michael Furland was a very similar story where he just wasn't very good in his draft year and then eventually the Flames picked him and he's turned into a quality NHL player. Fisher is a monster when it comes to fighting. <laughs> I watched some of those fight clips and it looked like those great fights from the 1980s where like the two guys would be just going at it, throwing haymakers at each other. So like he is a decent fighter, good with the uppercut, is willing to defend his teammates, a good all-around player. Uh, you know, with a fifth round pick, if you're getting somebody in that Austin Carroll Hunter Smith caliber where, you know, might eventually turn into a quality bottom pairing or bottom line forward that can play as well, that's important as well. I think this guy's going to be the next Garnet Hathaway for us. You need to keep bringing those guys in, the big, tough truculent guys who whether it's at the AHL level or you know stepping in to like you said a bottom line the NHL you need those big guys who are willing to do that yeah well you look at Pittsburgh what they just gave up for Ryan Reeves you know like Reeves is probably the best at playing and and being that tough presence so you know that it is valuable to have and the Flames are going to need that moving forward especially as like cap problems happen we'll need it so that way we can have cheap guys that we can plug in the lineup and if they can play even better just like with Rajishka, if fisher doesn't turn out to be much he's a fifth round pick no one's expecting anything and i think yeah, sounds- all, all four of our late round picks if none of them turn out it's like uh okay it was a weak draft you tried <laughs> so and i think sometimes that's better for the development you know these guys aren't there's not a lot of pressure on them to develop no it's just do your thing and if you turn out hey awesome it's like found money basically and the flames have been seen we've seen that from the last couple drafts with them too some really promising late round picks yep uh the sixth round pick 171st overall went to a quebec born player this is d'artagnan jolie uh, from Gatineau, Quebec. He's 18 years old, another right winger, six foot three, 181. And he's played for uh, Bay Como of the QMJHL for the last couple of years. And last year had a 48 point season, uh, 66 games, 16 goals, 32 assists for 41 total points, and one postseason point. What are your thoughts on Jolie, man? By far the best name of any prospect, period. D'Artagnan. Uh, yeah, three Musketeers. 
Uh, nice it's too to bad see. they don't put first names on the jersey because that name would look awesome on a jersey. Yeah, exactly. Maybe we should uh, lobby the NHL to make an exception. You know, like Ichiro in the MLB. Well, you know how some guys, like, you know, Cher, they just go by one name? I think this guy should just go by D'Artagnan. Yeah. He makes Cher, Bono, just D'Artagnan. That's it. Yeah. Uh, as for him, the player, a projectable winger with size and some skill, uh, we'll see, basically. Like, it, it's one of those things that he's okay not uh, gonna blow you away it's not like a manjapani pick where like the guy was a very high-end scorer just good so we'll see how he turns out um especially like in his draft plus one year we'll get a better read on like how much is he improving and all that kind of stuff he's very skinny at 63180 so like it's just have to wait and see. This is one pick where I think, you know what, his upside may end up being AHL. Um, I think he's got enough skill that he could, you know, turn pro, but I'm not seeing much of an NHL future for D'Artagnan. No. But, you know, stranger things have happened, so we'll see. Also, just looking at, you know, who we've got in the system, I don't think this guy's going to be very high. He's going to have to beat out a lot of guys to even get a look. Mm-hmm. And the last player the Flames took with the 202nd pick, round seven, was Philipp Svenningsen from Sweden. He's a 17-year-old left winger, six foot, 181 pounds. Uh, last year, he played with HV71 of the Swedish Elite League um, and their various junior clubs, so the, eight, the ju- Junior 18, Junior 20 team. And on the Junior 20 team, he had 37 games, 15 goals, 14 assists for 29 points and eight postseason points. I don't know much about this kid, Matt. What can you tell us? Uh, he's has a decent shot and one of those that Swedish players that has some skill to him. It's one of those things that you just have to basically wait and see for a year or two to see if he can take those next steps to emerge. If he does, then you bring him over. If not, you just, okay, thanks for coming out, basically, and we'll see. It's really hard to tell because of the fact that, like, his stats are decent for the league he was in. Not great. Like, if he would have had, like, 40 points, then that would have been something to get a little more excited about. But then I don't think he would have been in round seven either, but... Just got to wait and see if there's something there there or if it's just he's just okay. And it's a shot in the dark. You know, if it hits, great. If not, hey, you tried. It's a seventh round pick. Yeah, I don't expect to see Svenningson making the NHL either. I mean, it's always possible, but I wouldn't hold, you know, I wouldn't be putting money down that Svenningson wears a Calgary Flames jersey. Oh. So if we look at the draft, I think overall fills some needs. We needed some right wingers, especially. We've got a left winger, center, and a defenseman out of it. Good draft for the Flames. Anyone who wants to see these kids up close and personal, you can go to Winsport on July uh, 4th, 5th, 6th, and 7th. The Flames are doing their rookie development camp, and I would imagine all of these players will be in attendance. If you want to Except take a look. Except for maybe Svenningson. Maybe Svenningson won't be. Uh, the rest probably will be. So if you want to take a look at them, definitely come out there. Uh, Valamaki will be worth watching, seeing how he stacks up with some of the other rookies that will be on the ice. And, yeah, it's a great time to come check him out. So that's it. Winsport, July 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th. I imagine that the 7th is the day you want to come. That's generally when they do the, the full team scrimmages. So that will be the day to be there. Anything else about the draft you want to talk about, Matt? No, oh, just uh, glad to see that the Flames added some more pieces to the development pool and see how things go. Next year is going to be a boring draft for Calgary with no picks in the first three rounds. As of but, today, which is June 25th, 2017, I can not I can see Tree trading back into the top 90. Yeah, we'll see. I think he's got assets to do it. I think... I'd be surprised if we don't draft till round four. But we'll see how things go. 
Uh, well, why don't we take a look then? Talk, we've talked about the future of the team, the players the Flames have brought in. We've talked about the players that have been drafted. Let's talk about next season and some of what's happened here. So there is one player departing the team of all these guys coming in. That's Derek England. England got taken by Vegas in the expansion draft where he was signed as a UFA. I don't know about you. I was a little surprised by that. Derek England could be had on July 1st as a UFA. I'm surprised that they wouldn't have just waited, taken him on the 1st, and selected somebody else in the Flames. It seems a little bit like bad asset management. Well, it's one of those things that the NHL may have forced them to do so i don't know we'll see that i don't you know it, no harm to us because i don't think the flames were going to re-sign to england and he gets to play for his uh the team where he lives so good for him yeah i mean i'm i'm glad Derek england's getting to go home his family lives in vegas his kids live in vegas but you know again from vegas's perspective if they could have had say stajan and england or brower in england or furlan in england it seems like bad asset management to me well a lot of what vegas did was a little bizarre but you know it is what it is like they could have had Morazic, but instead they took no sec and it's like um i i know who that is but like uh not nobody else does <laughs> well, i'd rather have a, a pairing of Mrazek and flurry than a pairing of flurry and picard yeah exactly or they could have taken ranta or a whole bunch of different guys but yeah it, it was just a bizarre expansion draft by them but yeah you know, that's another whole conversation so matt i think we both agree that we've addressed the starting goalie need we've addressed the top four defenseman need the biggest need left in this organization is the Flames probably need to bring in a top six forward, preferably a first-line right winger. Would you agree that while Furland has been suitable there, he's not your first-line right winger for a team that wants to go deep in the playoffs? Oh, I yeah. Uh, if Furland's your first-line right winger, you're kind of not in a good spot. Uh, yeah, like he's viable there, but... I think there's a better option internally than to go that direction, actually. Um, and he, he's part of the 3M line. Matthew Kachuk. Why not throw him on the first line? Do so you think he, you can he, can chuck from a left wing to a right winger? Yeah. all He's a first line talent. He put up 50 points in his rookie season. He's not going to be stagnant at 50 points. So he's a first line player. He provides protection for Gaudreau because of the fact that, you know, he's Kachuk, give me a break, and (laughs) he can play. So he brings all the elements that Furland does, but with a legitimate first-line offensive player talent level. And that would then free up a lot of options for the Flames, because instead of needing to go out and get a UFA that's a first-line talent... Then you just need to find somebody that you can stick in the middle six. And you could, like I mentioned earlier with Jankowski, you could put him as the second line slash third line left winger with Backlund and Froelich because Jankowski is a very defensive-minded forward in the first place, so he would fit on that line. And it would shelter him by having him with two veterans that are the same type of forward. And that would allow you to have the third line and the fourth line being like, say, Furland Bennett and the new UFA or Brower, and the fourth line being Boma Stajan and either Brower or Lazar. It, maybe take Brower or Boma out and put Lazar in, but whatever. Like, there's options that way. Yeah, that's an interesting way to look at it. And as much as I agree with you, you could easily put. Um... You could easily probably put Kachuk on the first line. He's still young enough he could adapt to a new position. I'm not sure I want to break up the 3M line yet. Yeah, that that's the tough thing, because they did have a lot of chemistry together, but is that serving Kachuk, you know, because uh, he seemed to elevate both Backlund and Froelich, but in and of themselves, they're quality players, so you can use them in another way and with having Jankowski who's likely going to need some sheltering a bit anyhow just because he's a rookie 
you know, I think it might be better to, like, what they did with Bennett sticking him there and then Kachuk there, maybe sticking Jankowski, you know, make Backlund and Froelich the official babysitters of the Calgary Flames. <laughs> well, so, you know, the thing I think is interesting is the Flames have more forwards than they know what to do with right now. Yeah. Oh, for I'm, sure. I mean, if I look at my projected lineup for next year, I think it's going to be Goudreau, Monaghan, and I'm not sure who on the right wing. Maybe Kachuk, maybe somebody from a UFA. UFA. Yeah. I'm not sure. I think second line will be Kachuk, Backlund, Froelich. I wouldn't disturb that line if it were me. I think the third line is going to be Bennett, Brower, and Lazar. And that would leave the fourth line as some combination of Furland, Stage, and Boma, Versteeg, Hathaway, Chase on Hamilton, Jankowski. I think you might end up seeing a Jankowski, Stage, and Furland fourth line, at least to start the year. That's another way of going about it. It just depends, because like, the Flames only have a small amount of dollars left. I think they are about $9 million or so. And they need a number five defenseman and a backup goaltender, which if you sign Stone for say three and a half to four million and bring Johnson back for roughly what we paid him around two million dollars. Let's jump to goalies and defense in a sec here. Um, like you're not gonna have a huge amount of dollars left though after that. Like you're only gonna have about two and a half, three million dollars left. So it's one of those situations where things get a little dicey. So if we look at the forwards, I think that either way the Flames need a forward. Yeah, that's why I was suggesting throwing Kachuk on the first line because it's a lot easier to get a, a middle six winger. It, like it, There's plenty to choose from. And See, I would like to bring Versteeg back, but I don't know where he fits in. Yeah, that's unless the thing. we make some trades. I mean, I would be I would be fine to jettison stage in or Boma. I'm not sure it's going to happen. Yeah, I think we were stuck with them I like we were with Boma, Weidman. I can see Boma getting waived and sent to the A. Same here. Um, which could leave Versteeg in there, but you know, even if we look at top line wingers, what I want to be careful of if we sign somebody is I don't want another. Brower, let's go. Let's overpay for somebody who then underperforms. So I think they have to be careful with that. Yeah, and even then, I'd if they do go for a first line right winger, I'd actually rather them go for an older player like Williams or Marlowe or Yager, even uh, somebody that is just good, and you don't need to worry about having them around for too long, like a one or two year contract. Like your Mike Smith for the forwards. Yeah, exactly. Because you got to figure that, like, if Kachuk, if you do get the veteran guy, Kachuk gets another year to hone his craft, and then maybe you throw him out on the first line at that point. So that's kind of where I'm at, too. I would like to keep Kachuk on line two. I think it'll help shield him a little bit. It'll help him, you know, learn the NHL game a little bit before I transition him to to uh, first line. Yeah. And additionally, you could just leave Kachuk on the left wing on the first line and just throw Gaudreau on the right side like he usually is on the power play. So, you know, that's a possibility as well. So let's talk about some of those UFA right wing options. You'd mentioned a few. Justin Williams, a guy you and I talked about the Flames bringing in a few years ago. Williams is getting older now. He's got to be 35, I think. Let me just look it up. Um, So this might be a guy you bring in for one year. Is that veteran guy to play on that line. Uh, He is 35. He's uh, currently with the Washington Capitals. And last year he got 48 points. So I think even if you could get the same numbers a little bit better, he had 52 the year before, that's a good number for, you know, a pair with a, you know, Goudreau Monaghan. Yeah. And the same kind of story with Patrick Marlowe. He was in the same general point area. I think he had 47, I think. Um, Same kind of thing. You know, I think he's 38 now. Veteran guy, still fast, so he can play with Monaghan and Goudreau and not be an anchor there. Yager, you know, that would be just cool just because it's Yager, but, you know, I don't think that's a I, I don't. I don't think Yager's the best 
no. if you're trying to sell tickets to see our hockey team, you might be able to sell tickets to see number 68. But I think if we're looking at a a long, not even a long term, but you know, a two three year option, I don't think Yager is the right guy there. No. And another option that I like, because it would be amusing, would be to go out and give Sam Gagne a contract. <laughs> Just because of the fact that, you know, I think he'd be a little motivated to stick it to Edmonton. <laughs> Maybe. You know, he had a good year with Columbus, and like it, I wouldn't want him necessarily to be the first line winger, but, you know, that would be an option anyway. If we're going to sign a guy to be more of a depth winger, I'd rather take a chance on Drew Stafford than Sam Gagne. Yeah, that's a possibility, too. I think Stafford is coming off a bad year. You might be able to get him a bit cheaper. Yeah, um, that's why, like, with my thought of throwing Kachuk on the first line, there are a ton of options, then, for a middle six right winger or left winger. Like, you're talking, like, a list that's probably 30 or 40 names deep at that point, so... Yeah, I'm just not sure he's ready yet. Yeah, that's the hard, <laughs> you know... And I think he's found such a good place. I don't want to disturb that 3M line. I'd even be willing well, to take take a guy like Stafford and try him on line one, or, you know, like you are saying, a Marlowe or a Williams and put them there just to leave the 3M line intact. Yeah, well, I think Kachuk is actually a good enough player that it doesn't matter who he's with. And, like, at the beginning of the year, he was with Bennett and Brower. And honestly, I think that was the best that Brower played all year was when he was with Kachuk. <laughs> so, it's one of those situations that I think Kachuk himself is a good enough player that he can carry a line. And it's not really a surprise that Backlund had his best season as a Flame with Kachuk because you know you're playing with somebody that's actually good instead of you know some of the players that Backlund's been forced to have on his line so you know it's one of those situations where is you are you getting the most out of that player by having him on the 3m line or can he carry a line himself so it's one of those <laughs> You know, like maybe you stick back or Kachuk with Bennett as well and see how that goes again. So, yeah, yeah I just, I'm just looking at organizational depth and I just think Kachuk can be better used on another line. Yeah. Cause like if you put Kachuk with Bennett on and, you know, the new winger there, uh, it's possible that you could have a good second line that way. Well, I think so, even like a Chuck Bennett Lazar line could be pretty good. Yeah. So look at looking at the forwards. Then I think we both agree we need at least one forward. Um, do you think there's any current forwards RFA or UFA who we don't see come back? I'm finding it difficult to find a spot for Alex Chaseon, and like he had a decent year, but. Boy, the Flames have too many forwards, and... I think that... I agree with you. That was the guy I was going to say, and I think that as soon as we got Lazar, Chase on became expendable. Yeah, and Lazar is a better player, I think, overall than Chase on, and, like, while it sucks to let him go, because he did have a decent year last year, like, if we didn't have Boma, I think you'd keep Chase on, but... I could see signing Chase on to a deal, even a one or two year deal, and using him in the way that we had Hathaway as that extra forward, or sorry, as uh, Hamilton as that extra forward. That's possible. Yeah, uh, I think personally Hamilton uh, will get sent down to the A. I don't think that just with our forward depth, he needs to be up there as a fifteenth forward. Yeah, I agree. Uh, if they Probably keep him around, uh, if they keep him around, it's only just to, for Dougie's sake, basically. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I think Chase on if he signs, it'll be as a as you know the last forward. I don't see him coming up. I think Jankowski will make the team, but in order for Jankowski to make the team, somebody has to move, and I'm not sure who we can get value for at this point. Yeah. Um, I would like to see Versteeg come back, but again, I just can't see where he fits unless you can get rid of Stajan or Boma. Yeah. I know. Uh, I think Boma has to start the year in the A or 
waived and claimed by somebody but we, else. But we've said that about McDon- you know, Mason Raymond. We've said that about so many guys, and the Flames never want to do it. I know. Well, it so. sucks, but you know, you don't want to we'll pay two and a quarter million dollars to somebody that you're playing in the AHL. But when you have too many better options, like why are you playing the inferior player at yeah. that point? And I think the fact of finally making a you know a serious run might might make that that decision easier. Yeah, and especially like what happens if say Klimchuk or Shin Carrick play so well that they force themselves into the lineup. Yeah. Like, you know, cuz that could happen. They're both virtually ready for the NHL, so I think you know. that there's a market out there for Boma. Um and I think as a team that's now missing a good chunk of draft picks, I would even be willing to trade him for a third or a fourth. I'd even be willing to trade either Stajan or Boma for a seventh at this point, just to free up the roster spot. So the other yeah. n- the other name that's been thrown around, Matt, is James Neal making a trade with the Vegas Golden Knights to get Neal in. But when I look at that, I don't see what assets we would give up to bring Neal in. How about you? Yeah, you'd have to give up a first plus, and we don't have uh, any more first to give up. Yeah, no. Uh, like, it sucks that we can't, but I'd rather deal with it internally or assign somebody that's a UFA where it's not costing you assets. Like, yeah, Neil would be great to have, but do you want to pay the cost? I don't. No, so. and, and, you know, I think with three holes in the organization and two of them addressed in a week, we have enough forward depth we can make do. Like you said, move Kachuk to the first line. It might not be forever, but I think we can make do with what we have for a year on the forwards. Yeah, because like once and the even five if we were to address that next next season. Yeah, like it, once the five million from Stage and Boma goes away, like Backlund's gonna get a raise of about a million and a half or so to two million. So like you're basically freeing up three million dollars that you can then spend on somebody else, and so instead of like having two and a half, three million dollars to spend, now you have five, six million. You can get somebody good if you need to. So it's not really worth it right now. Like I wouldn't bother. Like it, it, we can deal with it internally if we can get a quality middle six forward. That would be awesome. Like, especially if we get somebody that's in that right age bracket. Like, uh, that's why I mentioned Sam Gagne. Because, like, that would be pretty much a perfect fit in terms of age. And he'd be motivated to stick it to Edmonton. But we'll see. We'll see. Um, Let's move to the back end. The Flames now address their number four defensive spot. We thought they might be looking to UFA for someone like Alsner for that. But... Giordano, Hamilton, Brody, Hamannick being number four. That leaves us three more spots on defense of five, six, and seven. Um, I think you have to bring up somebody from the farm to fill one of those. Either Anderson or Shillington needs to be brought up. Well, I'm figuring that Kulak will be the number six. Now, I would be perfectly fine having Barkowski being the number seven. Because you're not playing the number seven with any regularity. And, you know, like if he plays 10 games this year, I'd be shocked. But then the number five guy, I I would prefer having Stone back or another defenseman that's in that same generic ballpark, whether it's Girardi or Delzato or Franson. Well, those are some guys I was looking at. So I was even looking at Dmitry Kulikov could fit well that, there. Yeah, that's another guy. Uh, Del Zotto, Johnny Oduya would give us some of the toughness that we lose from um, Derek England. Yeah, like there's Franzen, plenty of options. Quincy, even Tenorti. Yeah, even uh, Brian Campbell, if you want to go with an older player. Like it, there are plenty of options for the number five if the Flames can't get stoned back. If that, you know, if Stone goes elsewhere, yeah, it sucks. But, you know, we do have options for the number five. And, like, it's not as big a deal. Uh, you know, it would have been a bigger deal if we didn't get Hamannick. But yeah, now I just we have him leave. and it. Yeah. I hate Sam Lee because he, we gave up a, an asset for him. Yeah. But, you know, he played well here. He was seemed to be a good fit. But. 
there are options at that point. So let's take Stone or Veteran Defenseman X. Yeah. We don't know as number five. You see, so you think Kulak becomes number six? Yeah. Especially because Anderson and Shillington aren't needing to pass through waivers this year. So why not just let them kick some butt in the Stockton? You know, like if Anderson plays well enough where he leapfrogs Kulak, fine. But Kulak has done enough where I think you need to see how good he is at the NHL level. And like in the 31 games he played, he, at least in the advanced statistics department, he performed well enough where there might be something there. And you do have to give guys a shot. Otherwise, you know, like guys like Fox aren't going to sign with you. (laughs) So, you know, give him a shot. If he does well, great. If not, you know, you do have Anderson and Shillington right there, ready to go. So, you know. So I'm I'm penciling in on my lineup. I'm penciling in Anderson number six and Kulak number seven. That's we'll, another way of going about we'll it. See how it goes. Um, I don't know who number five will be. I don't think that we see Bartkowski in the NHL. From what I understand, he was really brought onto the NHL just due to expansion draft stuff. Um, I think he'll be in the A. I think, you know, he might be a guy that comes up and down, but I'm just thinking if I wanted that sort of 10 game a year guy, I'd rather bring in Mike Kostka than yeah, Barkowski. Well, well, Barkowski's cheap, though. That's the main yeah, reason so why. Is I, yeah, but Barkowski's better than Kostka by a long shot. So, yeah, but I think Barkowski might be better served to help Stockton. It's one of those things that. We'll have to revisit this to see like who the Flames get as their number five defenseman. Would you agree that Alsner's that, probably off the table now? I wouldn't even want Alsner to begin with. No, uh, we talked we talked about bringing him as number four. I don't think we need him as yeah, number five. No, exactly. And I don't think he's good enough anyway for the dollar amount. I think he's going to have a lot of suitors and he's going to get overpaid. Yeah, exactly. To me, I think... I think Del Zotto still has enough value. He'll get overpaid. I can see Franzen or Kulikov being cheap enough to bring them in, if not Stone. Yeah. But I don't think you can bring in Stone and somebody. I think it's Stone, and then we promote from within. Yeah. Oh, so do I. I don't see the need for getting a number six as well. Like, you do need to give guys a shot. Otherwise, you know players aren't going to sign with you period like it you know you do want to be like chicago where you can attract free agents (laughs) and you know if you're not giving you know if you're just micromanaging and filling every single spot with a veteran guy and not allowing guys like say jankowski to step in when like i don't have anything more to prove in the ahl let me play then like i don't see kulak having anything more to prove in the a he either needs to put up in the NHL or you move on. And, you know, you have to actually give the guy a shot in order yeah. to see what you got. And Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I think Kulai makes the team. I just don't know where he's at. But I think that we'll have two call-ups make the team. Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't necessarily see the value in having two guys, like, one sit. Uh, I just don't like, think the organization looks at Kulak is a full-time guy. Yeah. We'll see. Um, it, I, it it largely d- just depends on how good Anderson and Shillington play. I'm also not convinced that Kulak... I think Kulak could be moved before training camp as part of a package for Sun. If you're trying to get someone to take Boma, you might have to throw in Kulak. That's a feasibility as well. So, we'll see what happens there. Uh, yeah, the lot- lots of options and permutation still to come it's but not I, like we're not gonna have things to talk about moving forward so no but i think the top four being solidified really I, I don't know about you i get a sigh of relief knowing okay it really doesn't matter in the end what we do with five six we can't screw it up that badly yeah like the four five the top four guys are going to be playing 45 to 50 minutes a night well, i said for so, the last 10 minutes you can't really mess that up no like nashville had uh Yannick Weber out there as their number six. Like, give me a break. You know, if they can handle that (laughs) and get to the Stanley Cup finals, you know, we'll be fine with whatever we throw out there. 
The last position then comes to the net. We know that Mike Smith will be our starting goaltender. Um, what do you think for backup? Do you think the Flames will go out and acquire a free agent veteran backup, or do you think we're at the point where we have to promote someone from within? If it was me, I would say let Riddich and Gillies battle it out for the backup spot and let her rip. The loser goes back to Stockton and plays with Mates and McDonald as the backup. Parsons is going to be the starting goaltender in the ECHL. Uh, True Living already mentioned that. So, you know, it, I, I think we have four goalies in four spots right now. And if we don't promote with from within, then we're creating a bit of a log jam where you've got, say, Mason McDonald in the ECHL as the backup with nowhere to play and that's not good for his development either like he needs to 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 put up or shut up and like yeah, there he can, is he can be loaned out though yeah but like that's not optimal either because then you're relying on the other team to actually play him and like it's not ideal yeah so like and gillies and riddich both played well enough where like, I'm expecting Smith to play 60 games next year, 55 to 60 games. He can handle the starting load like that. So, like, having uh, Gillies or Riddich being the 20-ish guy, game guy, that that's perfectly fine, too. Like, you, you do need to have guys learn. And, like, with the Flames having such a good defense core now... Like, you're not going to be exposing him like Marc-Andre Fleury was in his rookie year where he's getting peppered with 50-some-odd shots every game. You know, like, it, it's not going to be an abusive environment for the guys to learn in. And especially because of the fact that Smith's only here for two years, you really do need to see what you have in Riddich and Gillies and see whether or not they can actually take over the starting role in 2019-2020. So, you, and if you're not giving them those opportunities, then you don't know what you have. And you're kind of, well, then we need to go get another goalie because we don't know what we have. So it's... <laughs> I know where you're coming from. At the same time, when I look at Riddich and Gillies, I'm thinking, are they better served by both playing another year for more than 10 or 20 games? And I think they both would be. I would be most comfortable for me of bringing in a cheap NHL backup and making one of them steal the position from him. Honestly, I'm at the of the opinion that finding a goaltender, like a backup, at the trade deadline might actually be the best way of going about it and spending a third or fourth round pick and getting like this year's version of Yaroslav Halak, the veteran guy that's just bouncing around as the backup and spending an asset then allowing the goalies to play. Like if they fail, you know, let them play. If they fail, there's the option of going and getting somebody. For the playoffs? Yeah, you know I what know. I mean? Yeah, I, I know what you mean. I think for me, what I would rather do is go out and get a guy like uh, bring Chad Johnson back, get Darcy Kemper, Jonas Enroth, somebody we could probably bring in for a million, million and a half. And you know what? If if Gillies or Riddich wows us, wave the guy. Someone will probably take him. If not, you know, you send him down to the A to back up the other guy. Um bring him on a one, two year deal, but I would feel much more comfortable having that option of having say Kemper or Gillies or Riddich or Enroth yeah. or Gillies or Riddich. Yeah. It's just one of those things like how much faith do, does the organization have in those goalies period. And you know, it's one of those things that both the guys Riddich and Gillies have shown well enough in Stockton that, they're needing the opportunity to show what they have. and See, and, and I think with Smith here for two years, you could do one more year of two, let's call them veteran goalies, and then give both Smith and Riddich another year in the A and then let them fight it out You know, the following season. Yeah. It, it's also one of those things that, like, how much cap do you have <laughs> available as well? Yeah, I mean, we got a heck of a deal, though, on our starter. 
Yeah, but like if you say you you want to get stone and he costs three and a half, just to say. I don't think you pay three and a half for a fifth defenseman. I know, just sake of argument. And you want to get Sam Gagne, but he's going to cost four and a half, which again would be about right. Well, you're only going to have like a million ish dollars after that for the backup, so that may. Like, if you can get a better forward and a better fifth defenseman, do you spend more on those than the 20-game backup where you have two viable options as well? So it's one of those balancing act things where, you know, because the Flames are going to be pretty much tight near the $75 million cap either way. And and remember, we still have a million-dollar cap penalty that so, has been assessed for the Mason Raymond contract buyout. Yeah, so we'll see. Uh, this is one of those, you know, like especially with the prospect camp coming up, we'll be able to see Riddich and Gillies, see how they're looking. And I think that I I would be shocked if the Flames have a backup before then, either way, and see how things are. Like if. Both Gillies and Riddich look absolutely dreadful in the development camp. You might see it. Okay, yeah, we're going to need somebody to be the backup. I don't think where, there's going to be a huge goalie market on July 1st anyways, where you'd have to go out and you know overpay for somebody. I think you could wait till July 6th or 7th before you go out and make that acquisition. Yeah. You do decide to do a free agent. Yeah, exactly. I so, mean, everyone's pretty much got their goaltending tandem. We're one of the few that doesn't. Yeah, and there's plenty of guys available either way. So it's one of those that we're just going to have to wait and see. Like if both Gillies and Riddich bomb at the development camp, then yeah, you're, you're going to be more apt to go out. We need a veteran guy because these guys aren't ready. If they're looking like they are doing well at the development camp, I think that you have to give one of them a shot. Yeah, let, the, I w- let I them battle it out for the backup spot. And I wouldn't again, be unhappy if one of those guys becomes the backup. I just don't think that... I think that we have a year of leeway if we need it. Yeah, and plus you could also just invite one of the UFA goalies to training camp as well and have all three of them battle it out. Because, again, there's about 75 NHL caliber goalies and there's 62 spots, so... You know, it's one of those that you could also just do that as well and see how things shake out in training camp. Uh, you know, like, uh, there, there's always plenty of options one way or the other. Like, I think it was Enroth didn't get signed right until the end of training camp. So, last year. So, it, you know, it's one of those storylines that but I your, think... But we'll, your preference would be to bring up one of the kids. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you have to at some point let the kids play you know uh, i agree at some point i just for me i I don't think it's now yeah and that's why like i wouldn't be in a rush let's see how training camp goes see how things shake out you know there's always going to be a veteran backup available good point whether it's hudobin or enroth or you know insert name of about 10 guys here there's always somebody available, so it's not like, oh, we need to do this right now. No, you know? but but I guess looking <laughs> at September's rosters, um, yeah, I mean, we can definitely evaluate the kids. I I just feel for me, I would be more comfortable with, yeah, for one more year of veteran backup. Oh, I agree. It, it's just one of those things that let's see, like especially like when Penticton happens, you're gonna see Gillies and Parsons there. Let's see, basically. Let's see what we got and go from there. Yeah, because like if say Gilly stands on his head and looks like okay, he might actually be the goalie of the future, and like you need to stick him in the NHL, but oh, we've got this veteran guy. You know, it creates a bit of a mess. So see how things go. If you know, worst case scenarios that you have might have to so trade really what you're preaching here is not necessarily to bring up one of the kids but to wait until after training camp to make that decision whether that's a veteran whether that's riddich whether that's gillies yeah like if the two kids bomb then bring a backup in 
there's you always wanna, there's always you somebody as yeah. close to opening night to make that decision as possible. Yeah, because we just don't have that information available, and goalies are such a hard thing to put a marker on that it's just better just to wait and see and then figure things out. That makes sense. So, Matt, last question for you. If we round up the week of Flames news, the Calgary Flames unveiled their new Adidas Adizero jerseys uh, this past week at the awards ceremony. What do you think of what I'm going to call Edge 2.0 jerseys? They take a lot of what the Flames unveiled with the Edge jerseys and just kind of clean it up a little bit. What are your thoughts? Slightly better than what it was, but it's still one of the worst jerseys in the NHL. So, yeah, it is what it is. I think Minnesota and Colorado had the two best jerseys. Vegas's jersey wasn't bad. The white gloves are going to be weird. They're not wearing white gloves, so... Uh, they showed uh, them off with white Yeah, gloves. I know, but that's not what they're going to be doing. So, okay. you know, if they do go with white gloves, I hope they go with white skates, because that'd be hilarious, but... <laughs> you know, um, yeah, it, you know, underwhelming, but fine you know i think and, and we've heard from a lot of fans who wanted them to go retro wanted them to go with different colors wanted something completely different um i think if you look around the league for the most part there weren't a lot of radical changes there's a few teams that made radical changes but i think for most teams it was kind of poured over your current jersey the new template and keep going and i think that's what the flames did and i'm not dismissing the you know the option of having those jerseys in the future but i think for right now it was just Okay, let's port it over to the new template and move on from there. Yeah. I've never hated the piping on the current jersey as much as a lot of people did. Yeah, it's fine. Like, that, it, you know, it's okay. But, you know, this is one of those times when I don't think there's going to be a huge rush for Flames fans to go buy a new jersey. I think that even if you have the Reebok jersey and you wear it to the games, it's not going to look like you're outdated. No. It's not like when we went from the 04 jerseys to the Reebok jerseys. Yeah, it's one of those situations where, like, all of the jerseys that the Flames have had in their organizational history have been just okay. Like, they haven't had, like, a really dynamite-looking jersey, like, say, Ottawa with their O jersey, or, you know, like, a bunch of teams have, a, like, a really dynamite jersey. Like, Calgary's never really had one that's... I don't know. I thought that our 03 through 09 jerseys, or our 03 through 07 jerseys were pretty dynamite. Yeah, but even then, that was just a above average. Like, there was... It could have been better. And that's the thing. Like, Calgary's never had, like, a masterpiece jersey. And, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, I think a lot of people wanted to go with more of a retro color scheme, and I wouldn't be surprised if when the new arena comes out, we see that sort of throwback to an older color scheme. Um, you know, I'm I'm not unhappy with this. I think it, you know, it's good. It's a change. The biggest change people are going to notice is the font that's been on the back of the jersey since the uh, kind of forever now. I think since the pedestal jerseys, that italicized name font is going to be changed, and it'll be changed to a straight up and down. Uh, more conventional looking fonts. That'll be a big change. But otherwise, the pants are the same. I'd say this is kind of 1.5 of the jersey. The The flags are still there, which I hope they'd get rid of on the shoulders. Otherwise, it, it it's going to be pretty similar. Yeah. They just got rid of the stupid stripe that goes up the armpit. That's yeah, basically and I, and I it. Wasn't, you know, I never really was as opposed to that as a lot of people were. Yeah. It's just there it's not bad it's not great it's what it is and you know who cares <laughs> and i i'm i'm still convinced we'll see a change in the next three four years here for the flames yeah like i'm we'll expecting see. a third jersey next year and i'm expecting that the third jersey will be something in the retro theme and yeah i mean so is our last third jersey with the word calgary and script yeah we'll see it, it's like everything just gotta wait until the that comes out and then we can talk about it then. The last thing I want to mention before we sign off today is uh, remind people, if you haven't yet, to please take our listener survey. You can do that online at firesidechat.ch survey in your web browser, on your desktop, or your mobile device. 
The listener survey will take about 15 minutes, and it really lets us get feedback from you guys and what you want to hear in the show next year. Are there things we're doing that you say, yeah, please keep those? Are things we're doing that you say, you know what? Maybe you could change that or take something out of the show. We do this for you guys, and we want your feedback. Um, when you take the survey, it's completely anonymous. It takes about 15 minutes, but there is a section at the end to add your name and email address. If you leave us your name and email address, we have a prize pack with some fireside chat stuff, some flame stuff, some shirts, hats, that sort of thing. And we'll be giving them away to one person uh, near about mid-July here. And there's a post on firesidechat.ca showing off what that prize pack is. So if you'll help us out, go to firesidechat.ca slash survey, take the survey, then Matt and I can make the show better for you next year. And Matt and I will be taking about a week off, and then we'll be at the Flames Development Camp on July 4th through 7th at Windsport. So if you see us, come say hi. If you want to see all the Flames prospects in action, check uh, the Flames website, flamesonnhl.com, for dates and times of the scrimmage, which is probably going to be on Friday the 7th. And it's a great time to see some prospects, and we'll be back after that the following week with our analysis of what we've seen. Matt, anything else you want to go over before we sign off? Well, I'm just looking forward to September and October and looking forward to the Flames pushing for a division title and maybe the conference title After this year. After the changes we've seen, I'm pretty stoked about next year. Yeah, like uh, 50 wins might not be out of the realm of possibility, so we'll see. I'm excited yeah. for July 1st. I'm curious to see what the Flames are going to do. Um, I still think there's another shoe to drop somewhere. I just think we have two yeah, four same here. assets. I don't think we're necessarily going to, you know, trade Beaumont Stajan for James Neal, but I think somewhere there's another shoe to drop, whether it's recovering draft picks. Something. We, just, we can't go into the season with the roster we have. No, and it'll be interesting to see exactly who, what, and when, but, you know, it gives us something to talk about at a future date, so... And as always, if you're not following hockey as much during the summer, you can get all those updates. We'll tweet and put on Facebook when anything big happens. You can find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash fireside podcast or on Facebook at facebook.com slash fireside chat. And we'll make sure that all the news is there. And we've got some uh, pretty passionate fans who interact with us there. So it's a great place to share your thoughts as well. Matt, thanks for doing this and enjoy the rest of the week, Canada Day weekend, and we will see you at Winsport. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have an awesome week, and go Flames Go! This has been another Fireside Chat. Don't forget to subscribe to the show at firesidechat.ca. Follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash firesidechat. And to follow us on Twitter at Fireside Podcast. Catch our show on the podcast channel at thehockeywriters.com. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike License. Hosted by Dan Stevenson and Matt Dubor. Produced and edited by Peter Marino and Ryan Coetz. <laughs>